I want to give you something. Trek through the wildlands. Two pupils waiting for school to open. A school in the wilderness established by Osa and Martin Johnson. Osa arrives ready for a good day's work. Whitey, her dog, waits outside. More pupils appear. School is about to begin. But this is the last day, the last class which will be held. Osa and Martin are leaving for home tomorrow. They've spent almost three years in the wilderness. Now it's time for them to go back to civilization. Osa holds her last class. She spends the little time she has left among the simple primitive people, the natives whom she's always tried to help, to bring to them some of the blessings of civilization. One of the most important things she taught was the use of soap and water, bodily cleanliness, personal hygiene, the first step in preventing disease so rampant here in the jungles. Osa has succeeded in making a whole tribe conscious of the rules of sanitation to such an extent that it's become a habit, a part of their daily routine. The tribe thirsts for a feral ceremony steeped in ancient tradition. The strange, weird music begins. The drums thunder their message, their prayers. Hear us, O potent spirits who hold the power of life and death. Our white friends leave us today. Guide them with safety through the dense jungles where stalk the deadly beasts of prey. Let their safari cross the plains, the domain of the elephant and rhinoceros unharmed. Turn the vicious crocodile's eyes away from them as they ford the perilous rivers and streams. Let them return alive and well to their homeland. Duncan Bagel, Duncan Bagel, Duncan Bagel, Splash in the coffee. Duncan Bagel, Duncan Bagel, Duncan Bagel, Splash in the coffee. Lots of margarini, a filter fish, a computer fish of booty, pickle herring, a pickle herring booty, lots of booty, oh, lots of booty. Duncan Bagel, Duncan Bagel, Duncan Bagel, splash in the coffee. Even the very small children do their part in paying tribute to us. They dance with the clumsy step of those just learning to walk, a heartwarming sight to all of us. organized, we're ready to depart now. Begin our long trek through the wildlands, a trek which will take us to a distant point where our two planes, Osa's Ark and the Spirit of Africa, wait for our arrival. Then we take off for home. Osa watches the string of porters file by, each one of them carrying his share of the burden, the materials, supplies, which have enabled us to survive the rigors of the jungles through the three years we've spent in them. Osa and her aide follow the porters for a while to make certain that everything's going according to plan. Then they retrace their steps back to camp to inspect the other section of the safari. Action is the watchword. All are busy with their assigned tasks. Our journey begins. A long trek into adventure, danger, through the jungles, across the plains, over the mountains of the wilderness. All obstacles which must be surmounted by muscle, sweat, brawn, patient courage, and none of us lack these qualities. Precious water is carried in primitive fashion in earthen vessels of great weight. We trek through brush and thicket. 
track on feet that know the feel of jungle grass. Bare feet, which press against the soil of the wilderness. Strong feet, covering mile after mile of rugged country, hostile to their every step. Some trot along with small children clinging to their backs. All have their burdens. Osa travels part of the way in a primitive sedan chair, borne by native manpower. The head of the safari must conserve her strength for the ordeal ahead. We depend on her leadership to see us through. Wasn't it better to dispatch a letter to, a cigarette or two, and sweat it to the boys? You've got an ocean to, say no the ocean to, the big commotion, oh, the blow of hand of foe, over there, over there, over there, over there. It's an excerpt from a song. The more I read the papers, the less I comprehend. The world and all its capers and how it all will end. Nothing seems to be lasting, but that isn't our fear. We've got something permanent, I mean, in the way we care. There's another forgotten song. The great American folk song is a rag, a mental jag. Captures you, captures you with a pure melodic strain. It's a original art refrain. Has been inoculated with an ultra-syncopated rhythm, and with them... Is a happy, snappy, don't care, a rappy sort of... Oh, I don't know what to call it, but it makes you think of kingdom come. You jazz it as it makes you hum. Concert singers say they despise it. Horry critics never eulogize it. See, that's our national, irrational folk song. It's a master stroke song. It's a rag. Yeah. Pin. We pause for a while. Martin wants to photograph a pack of wild dogs sighted out on the plains. Evil, vicious creatures. Wolf-like in their habits, they travel in large packs and prey on much of the game in these parts. A rapacious species which has been known to devour a full-sized buck antelope down to the skeleton in less than 15 minutes. An unfortunate small animal streaks past. The wild dogs in hot pursuit. The action is so rapid that Martin's unable to follow the chase with his lens. A killer stands and takes in the situation, then joins the pack to get his share of the quarry. Some others look about for more prey. They scan the area for a victim, for the warm flesh of the kill. How many slang words of coffee could you think of? Java, Jamok, J. Joe. Four enough? Yeah. Do you have me, Bo? Eat it. Eat it. How many can you think of? Coffee? I don't know. Ink. It's five. Ink? True. Is that enough? Is that enough? Is that enough? Yeah, that's enough. We continue our trek through the wild lands. The porters march with trunks and crates atop their heads, slowly covering the vast expanse of land which lies between us and our destination. We walk until fatigue sets in. Time for rest now. We pitch our tents in the wilderness, a land of great forests and towering mountains which rise high above our little camp, dwarf us by comparison. It's a hot day. The sun's out in all its blazing glory. But this member of the safari has an antidote for the oppressive heat, a cooling shower jungle style. A few holes above the water level of the vessel, a little jumping up and down, and she sprinkles herself with cooling comfort. Some candid shots, taken by the practical joker of the expedition, of Osa and Martin Johnson preparing for another day in the wildlands. A domestic scene. Even in the jungles, Osa's careful about her hairdo. A woman's a woman, any place on earth. Martin's busy too. His face is the object of attention. Oh, that man, as if I haven't enough to do all day long. Martin, Martin, why don't you put things where they belong? A native announcing breakfast interrupts Martin's retort. Tell Cook to keep his apron on. We'll be right out. 
Another thing, Martin, you used my hairbrush yesterday. I couldn't find mine, Osa. If you were a little more orderly, you'd know where everything is. Why, I'm kept busy all morning picking up after you. I never rest. I... Yes, Osa. Man's work is from sun to sun, but woman's work is never done. And this sharp rejoiner ends the spat. Be they in a park avenue, a drawing room, or a tent in the jungles, a husband and wife will always reach a point where a difference of opinion exists between them. The famed jungle cameraman and the equally renowned big game hunter are no exceptions. We have guests, and Martin plays the perfect host to the visitors from the jungles. Some colobus monkeys who have decided to see at close range what's going on here. The only kind of hospitality a monkey appreciates is food, and Martin is just brimming over with it, much to the delight of the jungle denizens. Nothing bashful about them either. They're ready for second and third helpings, but why stop here? They'll eat as long as there's food to be eaten. A sly, greedy rascal wants the whole feast to himself, but Martin's too fast for him. As we travel to the wild lands, we meet old friends, tribes who shared many adventures with us on past exploration. The Lumbwas glorify our safari with a wild dance. The smooth-shaven, the bearded, all take part in the savage ceremony. The beat of the tom-toms drives this native into a frenzy. With undiminished energy, he dances on and on and on. receiving a spirited ovation from the Marus. <laughs> then the Nandis, expert spearmen, pay us a tribute with their colorful spear dance. The sound of the drums grows fainter as Osa leads the safari through the thick brush, leads us through a primeval region where the white man has never set foot before. The system of slavery is immoral. It must not be extended to the new territories. Cotton is king. We need slave labor to grow cotton. The federal government must act. The, the states, states have, have a right to decide for themselves. The states, states are a part of the union. Secession. The union. Secession. The union. Secession. 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 We all pause for a brief rest. And a brief rest it is. Osa drives us all just as hard as she drives herself. It's difficult to keep up with this remarkable woman. 
Who among us can match her amazing stamina, her strength of purpose? No matter where she may lead us, we follow with confidence and a feeling of security, even into the forbidding jungles that looms before us. Osa, her rifle loaded and ready for action, stops to examine the track of a large animal. She rises, her suspicions confirmed, a giant elephant's in the vicinity. We trek on, and none too soon, for just as we disappear into the brush, we see the mammoth root half concealed by the undergrowth. Martin quickly sets up his camera behind the heavy foliage. This is a picture worth any risk. It's our good luck that the wind is toward us. The elephant doesn't get our scent, but it may change at any moment. Bring the huge beast charging right into our party. Martin shoots a few more feet of him. Then we quickly move on. After many days trekking, we find ourselves in mountain country. The country of the earth giants, as the natives call them. A name which fits well, for they rise high into the clouds. This is the next barrier we must cross. The mountains behind us on flat land once again. We all breathe a sigh of relief. While we rest to recoup our strength, Martin trains his camera on a distant herd of zebras. Osa startles the herd to get some action, and she does. Off they run at top speed. The zebra can kick and bite with telling effect, but depends mostly on fleetness of foot for protection against the beasts of prey that stalk him. but the herd has little to fear from us. Any stalking we do will be with the camera, not the rifle. It's only pictures of them that Martin wants. The zebras stand on the plains, a comfortable distance away from our party. Martin continues to grind away, getting valuable footage of the striped horse of the plains in his natural habitat. But soon, we meet up with another specimen of wildlife, a far more deadly one. Traveling through the sumps, we suddenly come upon a warthog sunning himself, one of the ugliest and one of the most vicious animals on the face of the earth. The telescope lens shows every detail of his cruel face, his razor-sharp curled tusks. As he leaves the water, Martin's camera runs out of film. Bad luck, but he quickly reloads it and gets some shots of the warthog on land. The ferocious beast moves his head from side to side. His temper is rising, so we'd better leave him now. We meet one of the strangest products of nature, the crested porcupine, the largest of the species. This spiny armament is wonderful protection against the beasts of prey who keep their distance from him. There's a popular notion that the porcupine can shoot quills at his enemies. This is an old wives' tale which stems from the fact that the porcupine's quills are set loosely in his body. When a foe approaches, he trembles all over and some of the quills are shaken out, fall quite a distance from him sometimes, which reminds us that we've got quite a distance to cover yet. It's through the jungles again with bag and baggage. We've left much of the wilderness behind us, but there's still a lot more ahead dangerous country that we must pass through before our destination is reached. Emerging from the dense jungles into open country, 
We feel much safer because we can see what's doing all around us. There's no foliage where a killer may lurk. We march across the plains, drawing our strength from the knowledge that every step takes us closer to journey's end, to the place where two planes are waiting to fly us back home. We all walk on tired feet, feet that have trudged many miles since we left the little school. Our fatigue is so great that it seems as if we've been trekking for years and years. One of our boys breaks down under the strain of the long trek through the wild lands. But it doesn't stop us. If he can't walk, he'll be carried. We must keep moving at all costs. Nothing can hinder us, not when Osa leads the safari. She walks with the gun bearers, keeps them on the alert. We're entering the jungles again. And in the jungles, you've got to be prepared for anything if you want to see the light of another day. My fellow Americans, I come before you tonight as a candidate for the vice presidency and as a man whose honesty and, te and integrity has been questioned. We keep going, driven on by different motives. Our native boys will walk until they drop in their tracks because of gratitude. They want to repay Osa and Martin for all they've done for their tribe. The rest of us have visions of home and loved ones. Visions which have grown stronger, more vivid during the three years we've been away. At last we leave the jungles, feel the grass of the plains under our feet. And then we see it. A plane bearing the markings of the zebra, Osa's Ark. We've reached the end of our trek through the wild lands. This is one of the planes that'll carry us across the wide ocean, back to our country, our homes, our loved ones. And a little distance away, we sight the spirit of Africa with her giraffe markings, also waiting to fly some of us back home. Tents, tents with beds in them, beds to rest our bodies in, fatigue beyond endurance. 
We're all anxious to start for the States, but first, a long sleep. Osa's the first one up. She's ready to start for home anytime now. Some of the native children who live in this region come to say goodbye. Then their mothers follow, wishing Osa and her companions a safe and fast journey. Others step up one by one to shake the hand of this wonderful woman who's devoted her time and energy to bettering their living conditions. This wonderful woman who can meet the most deadly beasts of the jungles in combat and emerge the victor. This wonderful woman who in spite of her prowess on the hunt has a heart filled with kindness and compassion. We fly high above the vast plains, bound for home. Our long trek through the wildlands is over. Now our minds are filled with thoughts of those waiting for us, waiting for three years while we lived in the jungles. We return with our discoveries, our trophies, which will bring new glory, and the fond embrace of loved ones, face to face. In the town of Rudolph, Ohio, William D. Robinson, a retired oil well driller, has put together the most complicated piece of mechanism on record. Urged to take to whittling in order to cure a nervous breakdown, Robinson has carved the most elaborate series of wooden cams, crankshafts, pistons, bell cranks, and other gadgets. He runs them all by a small electric motor and calls his marvel an unfinished symphony. He calls it that because it will never be completed. He intends to add wheels and more connecting rods until the energy furnished by the small motor gives out or the gadget outgrows his barn. This curious machine has more than 8,000 parts. Practically every kind of movement known to machinery is represented here. Of course, it doesn't get anything accomplished despite all that transmission of energy. But isn't it interesting to watch? Mr. Robinson has hauled away over two wagon loads of Idaho pine shavings and has worn out over a dozen pocket knives. So if you're getting that high blood pressure, then whittle, brother, whittle. Peace is wonderful, isn't it? I, I hate war and I love peace. That's the truth. Indeed, it's the truth. Let us have peace. Superb sentence, isn't it? Yes. Let us have peace. True. Who said that? I just said it. Yes, Alva. We got a little rest. Now we have to go. No, you don't rest. You're playing football. You rest. Let me do this for a while. You really should rest. Let us do this work and then I'll leave and you can talk dirty forever. How's that? Fair?
This monkey is an orphan, separated from his mother since the day of his birth. He has been adequately nourished and well cared for. But literally, his life hangs by a thread. A soft cheesecloth pad that is his only companion, his only comfort. Once a day, the pad is removed for cleaning. Until it is replaced, the monkey is troubled, distressed. Permanently deprived of it, he may die. Die of loneliness. He may die for want of love. for new knowledge about our universe, our world, and ourselves. I'm Charles Collingwood. From Sappho to... Oscar Hammerstein, love has been the province of the poet. Its elusive nature has occupied and entertained audiences for thousands of years. But what is it? Your guess is as good as mine. But guesswork is not the way of science, and this is a scientific laboratory. In just a moment, we'll continue with the measure of love. Yes, he can play if you march away from the house. Johnny, get your gun and sword and pistol and fall in line. Bring your kitty car and bring your hobby horses, darling, to this marching time. Listen to the bugle playing Yankee Doodle. This is the primate laboratory at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. More than most animals, the rhesus monkey is like a human infant. At birth, this little fellow has the brain and the nervous system of a five-month-old human baby. In some ways, the monkey is farther advanced. He can walk and he can use his hands. In this laboratory, there are approximately 120 rhesus monkeys, the subject of a study that wants to know the answer to the question, what is an infant's love for its mother? The man in charge is a psychologist, Dr. Harry F. Harlow, a past president of the American Psychological Association. Well, now, that's a change for the better. He reminds me of a baby that's been given back his favorite blanket or toy. Exactly. And this simple, basic reaction made us believe that we could define and measure what had previously been undefinable and unmeasurable, the baby's love for its mother. Some people believe that this is built upon nursing. But is it not possible that this is formed from a need to cling and cuddle, a need for contact comfort? Now, obviously, in doing these researches, we cannot use real human mothers and human babies but we think we have the best possible substitute, a baby rhesus monkey. The responses of the baby monkey are very similar to those of the human baby. But in conducting these researches, we ran into a very difficult problem. To create an inanimate substitute mother over which we would have complete experimental control but a mother which the baby would love. Now, this is what we tried. Tap, tap, each step with the infant infantry. Hear the zing and the zang and the bing and the bang of the big tin pan parade. Hear the zoom and the boom as they march through the room on the big tin pan parade. You never heard such tunes as they pound on the pans with their tablespoons. Off they march to the cookies and thrum. They'll soon have a pain in their tummy tum tum. We constructed two substitute mothers. 
and they are unusual and remarkable mothers. They have absolute patience. They are available 24 hours a day. They never scold or strike their babies in anger. And we have absolute experimental control over them. Now this is the wire mother. We can build out or build in nursing as we desire. This is the cloth mother. It is only a wire mother with a cloth cover. We deliberately made the faces different. This has nothing to do with the present experiment. Now in each of these cages, we place one wire mother and one cloth mother with each infant. These are the only mothers these babies ever had. Half of the babies nursed on the wire mother only, the other half on the cloth mother. But both mothers were always available in the cages. And now for the real question. To which mother is there an emotional response? I can't imagine that they would make an emotional response to either one of them. Well, let's look and see. The captain, of course, has a broom for a horse as he leads them off to war. Little feet will retreat if they meet with defeat when they charge the kitchen door. It's Waterloo for Napoleon if he tracks across the linoleum. Clear the way, hip hooray for the big tin pan parade. Now here are number 105's two mothers. And here is Mucky 105. <laughs> Is that the mother that he was nursed on? Yes, indeed. Now, doesn't that prove, Dr. Harlow, the old theory that an infant's love for its mother is caused by nursing, which you seem to doubt? Well, let's see if it does. Let me show you a monkey raised on a nursing wire mother. Now, here are 106's two mothers. As you can see, it was weaned on a wire mother. Here's baby 106. Watch. He's going to the wire mother. Got the eat to live. Going back. He's back on the cloth mother and he'll stay on the cloth mother. Actually, this baby spends from 17 to 18 hours a day on the cloth mother and less than one hour a day on the wire mother. We had predicted that the variable of contact comfort would be a variable of measurable importance, but we were unprepared to find that it completely overwhelmed and overshadowed all other variables, including those of nursing. Frankly, doctor, if it comes to a choice between wire and cloth, it's reasonable to expect that any child will go to the cloth. It's a matter of creature comfort, like a baby with its blanket. But is this really love? Well, what do you mean by saying that a baby loves its mother? Certainly one thing we mean is that it gets a great feeling of security in the presence of the mother. Now, Mr. Collingwood, wouldn't you say that if you frightened a baby, that it went running to its mother, was comforted, and then all the fear disappeared and was replaced by a complete sense of security, that that baby loved its mother? Sure. All right. Then let's see how a baby monkey responds under these kinds of circumstances to its mother in our laboratory. Let's find out how deep 
an abiding, this feeling of affection of the baby for its cloth mother really is. Now, in this experiment, this is the apparatus we use. That looks diabolical. That's just the way the baby monkey feels about it. Flashing eyes, loud sounds, moving mechanical parts, all of these things are designed to frighten a monkey. Now here we have a peaceful, resting baby monkey. Let's find out what his reactions to his mother are when we frighten him. what any child will do in a similar situation. He runs away. It's more than running away. He was running to his mother to touch her, to drive away his fear. Contact with the mother changes his entire personality. Look, now he's actually threatening the diabolical object. All right. This gives us part of the picture of the strength of infantal love. And it tells us something about the importance of love in the development of the child's personality. But one type test doesn't make a theory. So let's explore this further in what we call... Hey there, Jimmy Dugan. You play that drum. Wum, tum, tum. Gordon, you play the bugle call. Gee, that's the best of all. Captain Fido's out of line. The open field test room. This is the most effective test that we have, and it was developed by Dr. Robert Zimmerman. Let's watch him run his experiments. This is a six foot square room with a few toys and other objects, but to the monkey, it's much more menacing. We know that when our own children are taken to a strange place without their mothers, they are often overwhelmed with fear. This room is just such a new and strange environment for the baby monkey. No mother is in there. Now, let's put a monkey into the room. Notice how cautiously he enters the room. He's searching for comfort, but nothing relieves his disturbance. Now we'll take the baby monkey out and put in a wire mother. Now this one was nursed by a wire mother. That's right, all his life. She doesn't seem to help much. Now, we'll try the same test with a cloth mother in the room. You see the contrast in the behavior? Despite the fact that the wire mother nursed him, she could offer this infant nothing in the way of affection or security. But here the monkey, by rubbing against the cloth mother, as if he were seeking as much contact comfort as he could get, builds up his reservoir of affection and security. First his body relaxes as the fear disappears. But above and beyond this, new positive response patterns appear. He now goes out to explore and investigate this new, strange world. He is now a normal, happy, curious baby. Now, suppose that in addition to an environment that is merely strange, we produce one that's really frightening. 
Mm -hmm. First thing the monkey sees when he enters is this fear stimulus. Mm -hmm. Just touching the cloth mother, holding on to her, gives him the confidence to examine the very thing that previously terrified him so completely. But we still don't know how compelling is this need for the infant to reach the mother. So let's have a plexiglass barrier put beside the fear stimulus between the mother and another baby to make it as difficult as possible for the monkey. Notice how he is relaxing. Slides down, clutches the mother, puts his thumb in his mouth. He's comforted. Then he's relaxed. There can be no question now but that this monkey loves its mother nor that love is crucial for the development of security. Security does more than make the monkey confident. It emboldens him. It is as if he knew that his mother would protect and safeguard him, that if necessary, she would give up her own life to save his. Little enough to ask from the inanimate mother. It seems to me she's doing better than some live mothers. Dr. Harlow, you've shown us the strength of this love. Just how lasting is it? Well, let's see for ourselves. In another room, we have some monkeys that are older than any we've seen up to now. They're more than a year old. These fellows all lived with a wire and cloth mother for the first six months of their lives. This one has been separated from his mother for six months. We're going to put him into a home cage to see whether he still remembers and loves her. You see, six months away from her have in no way weakened the tie between this infant and his mother. But we want to know more about the nature of this love, the changes it has undergone. We want to know if this monkey, who has been away from its mother for six months, gets any security from her presence. For this, we use the open field test room. First, we're going to run a baby without a mother. His reaction to the open field test is typical. There's no question about it, he's really frightened. Now we'll give him his cloth mother, but in front of her put a barrier and a fear stimulus. We want to see just how much he wants to go to his mother. Now remember, she's been away for six months. Monkeys that have been separated from their cloth mothers often show such exaggerated responses and such an intense need for security. Their love for the mother has not been weakened by this long separation, but instead seems to have been strengthened. Dr. Harlow, what happens to an infant who has never known any mother? Wire, cloth, or real? We're exploring that problem, too. This infant was removed from his mother right after birth and was deprived of all contact comfort for eight months. He has just recently been given these two mothers. At first, these monkeys get no sense of security in this new situation. But after a few days, these totally deprived orphans seem to adapt to the home cage. They even show a preference for the cloth mother. 
and spend as much as nine or ten hours a day on her. Does that mean that these orphans of ours who have had no affection at all can learn to love? We can test that out in the open field test situation. Let's see whether or not a deprived monkey gets any real sense of security from a cloth mother. Now, why won't he go to her? Because he has no real affection for her. That convulsive, rocking, jerking motion is called autistic behavior by psychiatrists and is also characteristic of human infants deprived of affection. We have run this test with both cloth and wire mothers in the room. Sometimes the monkey will go to the cloth mother, sometimes the wire mother. And sometimes he'll just huddle in the corner of the room. But, unlike the other infants we've seen, they do not appear to run to the mother, so much as they appear to run away from the fear stimulus. Mr. Collingwood, I can prove this in an apparatus which we call the flight box. face a monkey in front of this concealed fear stimulus. He will have the choice of going to the cloth mother or running down the alley on the other side of the petition to a place where he can hide from this frightening object. We'll try this first with a monkey that is always known, cloth mother. Which route will he choose? The reassurance of a mother or flight? We expected that because his sense of well-being depends on his love for her. If the deprived monkey has any such love, we'll get the same result. That monkey is only interested in escape. He cannot replace his fear with affection. These tests give us a new definition of deprived as it describes these infants. They are deprived of something which is extremely important, something which affects their entire personalities, something which we call love. From our experiments, we learn that there is a critical period in the development of the infants during which the affection for the mother is formed. For monkey, this is between 30 and 90 days of age. And with a human infant? Between three months and a year. If the monkey or human infant has not learned to love by then, he may never learn to love at all. So far, we've only been talking about a baby's love for its mother, Dr. Harlow. Are you exploring what happens when an infant reaches out beyond its mother? Yes, we believe that our greatest contribution lies in the development of techniques that may be used in the measurement of many kinds of love. Let me show you some of our latest studies. We call this our colony cage. These young monkeys playing together are learning to socialize. They are making friends with each other, just as human children do. How dependable is the affection of friends at that young age, and how does it develop? We have a test to measure this affection. Here we have the cloth mother in one corner of the room and the playmate in the other. In an ordinary situation, the infant first goes to the cloth mother for comfort, but he would rather play with his friends. I had another lad, but my heart now is sad, for he's gone to return no more. Little feet now are still, 
how my poor heart would thrill just to have him track my floor. Now, let's see what he does when he put in a fierce stimulus. In the face of fear, the love for the mother is stronger than the affection between friends. We know what happens when children look excessively to their mothers for affection. They have difficulty building other relationships with other children, with other adults. But we do grow up, and so do monkeys. We do form social relationships, and so do monkeys. How does this happen? What is the process? We believe that we are developing methods that will enable us to determine the basic motives and emotions underlying our everyday lives. Thank you, Dr. Harlow. I suppose that we've all been in love, or want to be. We all know what it feels like, but we don't know what it is. Today we've seen how Dr. Harlow and his associates at the University of Wisconsin have learned something about love. They hope to learn more because there can hardly be an emotion more important for man. And until man knows himself, he can know nothing. I'll be back in a moment. How my poor heart would thrill just to have him track my floor. So never soul if your little son wants to drag across your linoleum. Let him play while he may in the big tin pan parade. To illumine the dark corners of human knowledge is the goal of science. But not all those dark corners are in the icy reaches of interstellar space or among the vagrant particles of the atom. Some of them are in ourselves. Today we've seen how science brings its method and its logic to familiar yet mysterious questions about ourselves that have so far defied exact definition or analysis. It's fitting that in this day when science reaches out to probe the farthest stars, it has not lost contact with man himself. This is Charles Collingwood.
Less than an hour ago, Claudia and Nikki's young daughter, Penelope, slipped from the seclusion of her bedroom in nylon pajamas, fur slippers, and a negligee, cautiously let herself out the back door, quietly tiptoed to the garage. And the next thing anyone knew, out of the garage shot Claudia's car. And Penelope was headed on the ride of her life toward willful disaster. Where are all the state police? Why hasn't someone stopped her headlong, heedless rush to self-destruction? Look out, look out, Penny, look out! Oh, no. Oh, no. Instantaneously, the name Liza reminded me of the, the George Gershwin hit from Showgirl, Liza. Yeah. <whistles> Liza. It's a failure, that show, I heard. It didn't really make any money. But it produced a wonderful song. Yeah! Didn't yes, it, Robert? That's true. Maybe so a it's few. It's a failure. True. Big dead sand high school. Yeah, yeah. Two 
wait now. Let's see now. Are you in City Blues? Look at my first challenge. My first pack. All right. Uh, would you like to read it out loud? No, you read it out now. Uh, two men are on a bus traveling en route to Union City, New Jersey, desperately trying to capture the long ago memories of their lost youth. Oh, it's beautiful. I like the way you wrote it because you see, uh, you didn't write the way I, I described it. You, you've uh, used a little poetic license, my boy. You're all talented, you know. What do you have to say about that? Yes. But this this shows possibility. We should maybe sit down someday. We'll never have the time. We're Who kidding said? ourselves. Look, 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 but so is it worth another five years of agony and frustration and rejection and tension and waiting and harry and agony? Is it worth it? Is it yes, worth it? it is. For me, it's worth it. Hmm. No, see, well, who's going to work hard. with you in this film? This new is Union City Blues. Who's going to act in it without pay? <laughs> Not me. Wrong. <laughs> the Minions of Midas. By Jack London. October 1929. We had mortgaged our homes, borrowed money, danced to the tune of Get Rich Quick, and now we had to pay the piper. If you mean the grocer, mister, you're right. We have no money to buy food. No place to live. Can't pay the rent. No place to work. There aren't any jobs. Poor boy has fallen asleep. He's been writing a song for the NRA. There's nothing like a good song to inspire a nation. Things are getting better every day. Well, Abe, it looks as though we can stop worrying about our country. President Roosevelt has it headed right again. All it needed was a plan of action and a man with the courage to put it through. 
There isn't a person in America who won't profit by the National Recovery Administration if every man, woman, and child will do his part. You can always depend upon Americans. Did I hear... Did I hear someone mention NRA? Oh. I didn't realize who you were. You see, I've just been writing a patriotic song. I must have fallen asleep. Don't excuse yourself, my boy. We've been watching you. In fact, I've been watching everything that has happened in this country for over 157 years. I've seen it grow from 13 states to the greatest and strongest country in the world. And now, through the National Recovery Administration, the NRA, it is striving forward to finer and better things. I know the NRA is a great thing for America, but you see, I'm just like thousands of others. I hardly know exactly how it operates. If you'd explain it to me, it, it might give me an idea for my song. Just what do you want to know? What is the idea behind the NRA? What will it do? It will end unemployment and restore the purchasing power of the American people, a thing this country has been trying to do for many years. Oh, great. Tell me more about it, will you? President Roosevelt has asked each employer to split up existing work to give more people jobs and see to it that every man has a living wage. Yes. President Roosevelt has asked each employer to split up existing work to give more people jobs and see to it that every man has a living wage. Yes. A man and every man's job. I live to see the freeing of the slaves. But this is a step toward the freeing of the slaves of the sweatshop and giving the toilers a chance to enjoy the beauties of life. What can I do to help it out? You and 120 million other Americans can help by patronizing stores that display the Blue Eagle. Those stores are sharing to bring back prosperity. I suppose everybody is compelled to sign the NRA code. No. This is a gentleman's agreement. President Roosevelt is asking each to lend a helping hand for the common good. Oh, I see. As soon as everybody goes back to work, they have more money to spend, and that would increase business everywhere. Is that right? That's it exactly. The more people buy, the more things the manufacturers will have to make, and the farmers will have to grow. And the road to better times will be open again. The road to better times, open again. Open. Why, that's it. That's an idea for my song. Listen, here it is. There's a new day in view, there is gold in the blue, there is hope in the hearts of men. All the world's on the way to a sunnier day for the road. There's a song in the air, it's the music of busy men. Every plow in the land meets a happier hand, cause the road is open again. There's an eagle blue in the White House, too, on the shoulder of our president there, with a lusty call telling one and all, brother, do your share. gold in the blue, there is hope in the hearts of men. From the plain to the hill, from the farm to the mill, all the road is open again. Everybody sing it. There's a new day in view, there is gold in the blue, there is hope in the hearts of men. All the world.
Is everybody happy? Why? Then 
things and talk at I don't like the way she looks at me. Oh, she's only my godmother. Depression was the worst in the nation's history. Ten million unemployed, bank failures, bread lines. Brother, can you spare a dime? No deal, no deal. That was the promise of our newly elected president. And while we watched anxiously, hopefully, Franklin Delano Roosevelt rolled up his sleeves and went to work. To start the big recovery, we'll pass the NRA. To help the banks, we must declare a banking holiday. We have no fear, but fear itself, till this depression ends. So let us work together, and I promise you, my friends, you're getting a new deal, new deal. Everybody's gonna get a new deal. Hitch your wagon to a star, cause if DR is giving us all a brand new deal. To raise the price of farmers' goods, we'll pass the triple A. Our plan for public works will put you back to work today. For labor, there'll be better hours and a better wage.
the news to Adolf and the son of the rising sun. Tell Duce what we've done. Then tell him we've just begun. Tell him they ain't the seen nothing yet. Tanks. We'll keep them rolling. Planes. We'll keep them flying. Guns. 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 Keep them shooting. Give them hell. Chaplain Downey, at the advanced base of Tinian, prayed for the safety of the men who were carrying out the first mission of its kind. We pray that the end of the war may come soon, and that once more we may know peace on earth. May the men who fly this night be kept safe in thy care, and may they be returned safely to us. We shall go forward trusting in thee, knowing that we are in thy care now and forever. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States. The world will note that the first atomic bomb was dropped on Hiroshima, a military base. Allison! Diesel! Shells, batteries, bearings, carbines, tools, cannons. On for America, to build for victory. The great American game, the political nominating conventions are fascinating and unpredictable. For example, in 1952, one man loomed above all others as the likely choice for our next president. But it was not until he addressed the convention that anyone knew for sure what Ike's politics were. Ladies and gentlemen, you have summoned me on behalf of millions of your fellow Americans to lead a great crusade, mindful of its burdens and of its decisive importance. I accept your summons. I will lead this crusade.
and social security for when you reach old age we're getting a new deal new deal there were other memories too pearl harbor guadalcanal d-day d for victory There's a battlefield at Gettysburg where swords and sabers rust and brothers who were flesh and blood are scattered in the dust. But every night at Gettysburg when everything is still they say a golden bugle blows on Cemetery Hill. Who was the unknown bugle boy at Gettysburg that day? And was he wearing Yankee blue or wearing southern gray? what you have seen. Woe to you, unbeliever. I go to preach the great crusade.
Disapproven, keep them daughters moving raw high. Don't try to understand him, just rope him. Tell him, brand him, soon we'll be living high and wide. That was not sung with any kind of cowboy spirit. Well, I'm not a cowboy with a spirit. Or downtrodden New York, but I don't like it. <laughs> 